Greetings to you all, our viewers and listeners living and working in different parts of the world. Welcome to yet another episode of The Conversation. My name is Anotida Chikumbu. I am your host. And today, my special guest is Professor Henin Melba, who is a Director Emeritus of the Doug Hammarskjöld Foundation, as well as the uh, Emeritus Research Director of the Nordic Africa Institute. Today, we are set to discuss his book, Doug Hammarskjöld, The United Nations and the Decolonization of Africa. This book was published by Hest Publishing in 2018. I'm going to paste the link to the direct access of this book on our Facebook page and write in the comment section and on our description panel on our YouTube page. Professor Hianin Melba, welcome to the conversation. Thank you very much, Anotida, and thanks for having me. It's a great privilege and honor. That is wonderful. I'm also happy to have you. How is your day going so far? And how is the COVID-19 situation in Sweden? Well, the day is so far very well. I was looking forward to our conversation. We are time-wise uh, six hours ahead of you. So it's already most of the daylight gone. This is Sweden, so we enter darkness again that time of the day, which means a couple of minutes after four o'clock in the afternoon. We have since two weeks proper snow, minus 10 degrees. So that's what the Swedes want to have that time of the year because they can go skiing and skating. But due to COVID-19, mobility is limited and we face an uphill battle similar to you on your side. Uh, it took a huge toll on the population and uh, we really sincerely hope like you and for everyone else in the rest of the world, that the worst is soon over and that we manage to maybe find a way into a new normality, which based on some lessons, maybe might become a bit better a normality than the old one was. That's at least my hope. Sure thing. Uh, we do remain optimistic that the situation uh, changes and uh, we get back to live uh, the life that we, uh, we enjoyed before the pandemic. Uh, each and every country is facing unique problems that are unique uh, to their particular country uh, with um, a specific reference to the strength of their health delivery systems, their population, uh, the responsiveness of their governments. But I believe that uh, things are going to change. So now I'm very happy to have you, uh, Professor Henin Melba, to discuss this book. Um, and. Um, the first question that I would like to uh, you to just answer, maybe before we get to start uh, the discussion of, of the content of the book, uh, I understand that you, you, you are the Director Emeritus of the Doug Hammarskjöld Foundation. Uh, can you just briefly describe the work that, uh, the work of the Doug Hammarskjöld Foundation and the work that you do or that you have done in the past as Director of it? I will gladly do so, but first let me extend a compliment. The way you pronounce Dark Hammarskjöld is really good. A lot of people, when they see the name, have problems how to pronounce it. You made it perfect. I'm that, impressed. That is wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, our Professor Henning. Well, the Dark Hammarskjöld Foundation is turning 60 years uh, next year. It was established upon private initiatives of the Swedish public following the untimely death of Dark Hammarskjöld. And uh, it was then by a decree of the Swedish king, because we still have a monarchy in Sweden, even if it's hardly known, it was established as an autonomous foundation in the mid 1960s, based on uh, money donated to keep the legacy of Dark Hammarskjöld alive. But then following quite a Swedish cultural pattern. The Dark Hammarskjöld Foundation was eager not to put the person in the center. That's against the Swedish grain. You do not really um, hold high persons. So the Dark Hammarskjöld Foundation did something else. Uh, it lived up in the late 60s, 70s and 80s to the cosmopolitan approach of Dark Hammarskjöld to international solidarity to promoting issues of the global south, in particular Africa. Uh, Kisarbo was a very close friend of the foundation, uh, the historian from West Africa. He visited many times 
they work together with people like Johann Galtung, uh, the peace and conflict researcher, with Vandana Vashiva from India. And the Dark Hammerfeld Foundation was instrumental in bringing about the notion of another development in the 1970s. And it started to publish a journal called Development Dialogue in close to 80 issues today, which can be accessible on the website of the foundation, like many other publications, for free download. And it became a member of a pioneering alliance in anti-dominant paradigms and discourses related to so-called development, questioning the dominant interpretation of development and spreading out in global alliances, which uh, were then in the 90s and beginning of this century, uh, linked also to the World Social Forum. But like other foundations and institutions, there are different times and different stages of the foundation. And by that time, the Swedish state did have a closer look at what the institution does and it had a more conservative policy orientation. And since the foundation in the meantime was dependent on state funding from the government, the government felt it was too much of a loose cannon, if I might say so. That's also a general global tendency you could witness in the 1990s at the turn of the century that governments looked more seriously, that they limited um, the maneuvering space of civil society, especially when they had reasons to participate in the decision of the agenda setting by funding those activities. So they felt um, the foundation is not really on the track they wanted to have it. And that was the situation when I was recruited, not because I'm a conservative, but basically to do two things, to put the foundation back on a UN related agenda and to bring Africa back in, which was not in the picture any longer. And that was not so difficult to do because these days, looking at the United Nations, you can do basically everything and create a link to a United Nations agenda. That's not very difficult. So that was not really a need to compromise. We were still anti-hegemonic, anti-mainstream in all what we did. Um, since my retirement, the foundation worked closer with official foreign government policy, especially since the Social Democratic and Green Alliance is back in government and very closely now has a working agenda on uh, the United Nations with four United Nations related thematic focus areas. It's peace building, Agenda 2030, global governance and United Nations renewal. And what the foundation did since I joined it is to bring in the legacy of Dark Hammarskjöld mm -hmm. and not to pretend that the Dark Hammarskjöld Foundation has nothing to do with Dark Hammarskjöld. Mm -hmm. So we started to focus more on what did he personify? What were the values and principles which are worth to be kept alive as part of a wider agenda, but integrating what he stood for in what we are doing today. And that to some extent, Anotida was a contributing factor why I, after retirement as director, thought this is now ultimately the time which I never had before to try to compile what I thought is closest to my own interest, and that is the role of Hammarskjöld in the decolonization of Africa during his terms in office as Secretary General of the United Nations. That is wonderful. That is a great work. That was a profound experience. I'm sure you loved it. Now that uh, you've mentioned the word, uh, the name Doug Hammarskjöld, uh, at the center of your book's analysis is uh, the personality of Doug Hammarskjöld. Uh, his career is the second uh, General Secretary of the United Nations. Um, what were the ideas, uh, he, uh, his ideas, the ideas that he st stood for uh, regarding the United Nations? Uh, 
uh, great power politics and the independence of African countries. I'm grateful, Anotida, that you stress that at the center of the book is the role Dark Hammarskjöld played. Because while the book was received uh, rather well uh, through reviews, there were sometimes some underlying misunderstandings. While I stress explicitly at the beginning of the book that it's an effort to highlight the role and thinking of Dark Hammarskjöld, the title, of course, puts it into the context that he was the highest serving uh, official of the United Nations, and it's focusing on his role in the decolonization of Africa. And some reviewers then felt, or tended to forget that I stressed, it's about Dark Hammarskjöld and how he thinks and tried to act. They critically observed, there's a lack of reference to the context of decolonization of Africa mm -hmm. and global governments and the Cold War and this and that. And yes, there is. So if you want to read about that, then I would not recommend reading that book. Mm -hmm. But if you would want to learn more about the options, the scope and mm -hmm. the limitations of an individual person in a global governance body on a certain issue such as the decolonization of Africa during the Cold War era of the 1950s and to learn about the values and principles of that person and how that person tried against all odds to translate these into diplomacy and policy, then maybe that book might be worthwhile a read. So having clarified that, I hope, to avoid any frustrations or disappointments for those who might consider if they should have a look at the book, it needed, of course, to contextualize the individual person, Doc Hammarskjöld. We all have multiple identities. I firmly believe in that. Uh, even if identity politics wrongly so, especially when it's uh, coming in racist uh, connotations, pretends as, as if there are singular identities, which I dismiss. But to explore the multiple identities, you still have to go back to the roots, to the socializing impacts, which do not suggest that we are predetermined. While I'm speaking to you as an old white man, it doesn't mean that by definition, I have to be racist, homophobic, um, and uh, anti-sexual emancipation or whatever. We all as individuals have options, but we have of course a certain internalized set of behavioral standards of values through our childhood, our upbringing, through our exposure to certain institutions in a given society. And this is where in regard to Dark Hammarskjöld and his serving as highest international civil servant, the values and norms and virtues of the Swedish civil service of the early 20th century comes into the picture. Because Sweden and some other Nordic countries are quite interesting examples how surfing the public interest in the civil service is considered an honor and a duty and selfless in a state which like any other state never has been neutral, but stressed the role of facilitating between conflicting interests. Negotiating, looking for compromises, creating platforms between labor and capital, and creating in the 1940s, 1930s, that what we refer to today as the Swedish welfare state. And Dark Hammarskjöld, very early in his career, was a part of the creation of the Swedish welfare state. He was intellectually very bright and gifted, 
He studied languages, philosophy, but he ended as an economist. He did a PhD as economist at the London School of Economics, a very mm -hmm. renowned institution, mm -hmm. and Gunnar Myrdal was his opponent. So something people very often tend to ignore that the second secretary general of the United Nations mm -hmm. was a trained economist. Sure thing. But you, if you look at his way of thinking and handling matters, you can rather sooner than later come across economic thinking. Mm -hmm. For example, he very early in the early 1950s, when he became secretary general, mentioned once that for him, more important than the UN Security Council is ECOSOC because he said the Economic and Social Council of the UN because he said and that was his argument which is until the very day an argument mm -hmm. if you do not fix economic inequalities you will not be able to establish lasting sustainable peace and development that's very true that's very true that's what Hammarskjöld said 60 years ago. So, and he came with this ethics that as a civil servant, which he was in Sweden, you serve values and principles for the public good, for the ordinary people. So when he moved into the office as Secretary General of the United Nations, for him, the United Nations um, Constitution was the secular Bible. And very soon into his office, a lot of people who saw him preaching that called him a secular Pope. And for him, the one relevant guideline in everything he tried to solve was what does the UN Constitution say? What are the duties and obligations of the member states who ratified mm -hmm. the UN Constitution? And what are the duties and obligations for all the global conventions signed and thereby ratified also as domestic law by member states. Now, that's of course a huge task. And as we know until the very day, member states sign up to all sorts of things from the anti-genocide convention or genocide convention as the first of its kind to the human rights convention adopted one day later already with markedly less votes, interesting enough, um, to all the conventions and global governance normative frameworks which we have in place until now, member states are rather quick in signing up and rather slow, if at all, in living up to the meaning and spirit of the conventions they sign. Mm -hmm. So it rests to a large extent in the power of definition. Who interprets what? To use maybe one obvious example, Western countries are very eager in stressing human rights and democracy. Mm -hmm. But there are countries, they have an interest in protecting. They can violate human rights and democracy and the West wouldn't care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the same with the Eastern perspective. They are quick at hand to cry foul when some countries they have strategic interests in need their assistance and help. But if it's other countries where they are violating the human rights principles and other values and norms, they say, well, that's a misinterpretation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we end up, well, who is right? Now that created already the Scylla and Charybdis of anyone holding that office in the United Nations at the helmet of the secretariat, which is actually tasked to implement an agenda setting constitution of the United Nations, which actually is not truly respected 
by those who hold global power. Mm -hmm. It might be respected more by those who are not holding the global power because for them it's important that it's respected, otherwise they are all the time at the receiving end. But they are not the ones who have the decision-making power in the Security Council, which was always a challenge of Dr. Hammarskjöld. So, and the other thing is, you are not operating in a vacuum. You need those around you who advise you. They are recruited from different member states. They are following very often proportions. And in the 1950s, they were mainly Western civil servants, mm -hmm. middle class uh, civil servants from Western countries. And those from the global South, like India, Tunisia, Middle East, or other countries who already had a degree of participation that they could send officials to the global governance body, they also had a typical middle-class background, educated in Cambridge, Oxford, you name it, speaking English as a, as a second language, language or yeah. the first language, molded in Western thoughts. Mm -hmm. So basically, even when they looked different, they acted and thought alike. Yeah, yeah. So the United Nations and still having traces of that until the very day, but clearly so in the late 1940s and the 1950s throughout, were much impregnated by Western thought. Now, even if you are more open to other world philosophies, other religions, which very clearly Dark Hammarskjöld was, yeah. you are operating in a defined context. And the people you have to rely on because you're not acting as an unguided missile are socialized and reproducing normative values and perspectives of a similar kind. Mm -hmm. So not that it would be autistic, but it's a confined setting. Yeah, there are structures that are actually set. Absolutely. Yeah. And so the limits to transcend these structures are extremely high, even if you wanted to transcend them. And sometimes you might not be even aware where the borderline is. So one, and that's very important to keep in mind because we should not celebrate an iconography. Of course, um, there were limits to anyone in that position. There were limits to Dark Hammarskjöld. And he was not flawless either. Maybe we come across one or two examples later in our conversation. But I think what is important, what for me was important, to trace and explore what made Dark Hammarskjöld tick. What was a substantive part of, what, of his integrity? A key term for him and a key term for me, the more I became familiar with Dark Hammarskjöld and how he argued and how he acted. Ethics, principles, and integrity. And actually a key term of Swedish society, which he lived up to in the international context, namely decency. You have to behave decent. That means you also, that includes moral standards. You speak truth to power, you do not sell out, you do not betray your values. And even if you are not able to take a decision the way you want to have it, you make it very clear where you stand. Mm -hmm. So for him, a key notion during the eight years in the office was the integrity and independence of the international civil service. Mm -hmm. And he stressed continuously that international civil servants, and that message is as loud and clear until the very day, are not there to be loyal to any particular member state of the United Nations. Nations, yeah, yeah. But they have to be loyal to the charter 
of the United, United Nations. Nation. Exactly, exactly. And he argued all the time like that, which also he said does not mean you have to be neutral. Because if the charter stipulates certain values, you have to take side with the values. Mm -hmm. So if you are basically in opposition to member states, it doesn't mean you abandon neutrality if that opposition is motivated by the loyalty to the values as contained in the charter. Then he argues further, it speaks to your neutrality mm -hmm. that you are in opposition to certain member states. And I think that was one of the core legacies he left behind, far beyond diplomacy and politics. When you, fire, when you talk to UN staff today, retired ones, current ones, if they have one role model among all the secretary generals, then in their absolute majority, they will name Doc Hammarskjöld. Yeah. So that is basically, coming back to your question, uh, the motivating force of the book, mm -hmm. where when it comes to the sources, I indeed, as I flagged at the beginning, did not take stock of, uh, I don't know, the several hundred very good at times books on the Cold War mm -hmm. or on the decolonization or even uh, going to the archives of the United Nations, looking up how decisions were made. Mm -hmm. My main source was four volumes of the speeches of Dark Hammarskjöld, mm -hmm. compiled posthumously and available. And they add up to more than 2,600 pages of statements, speeches, press conferences, recorded ones, um, where Dark Hammarskjöld explained the various uh, interpretations of his policy, his ideals, and so on. 2,600 pages, because it's very interesting if you see, while some review, reviewers uh, observed, I'm lacking the reference to the context, I have observed in the past, even those who write about Dark Hammarskjöld in the context of other things, they hardly ever visit what he really said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to do the opposite, to approach that subject through the lens of looking at what Hammarskjöld said between 1953 and 1961 on 2,600 pages. Mm -hmm. And they show a remarkable perseverance and continuation. Like the independence of the International Civil Service was a subject the moment he moved into office and was one of the last subjects he raised before his untimely death uh, in Dola in 1961 at a fundamental lecture at Oxford University. Mm -hmm. So there are upcoming things, the same decolonization, the same like giving voice to those who don't have a voice, mm -hmm. challenging the normative power of the big countries. And there it's very interesting also that many people because of his background and because of the nature of the United Nations and because of the role the United Nations played in fundamental conflict, conflicts, perceived Hammarskjöld as an agent of Western imperialism. Imperialism, well, yeah, yeah. Well, I rather would advocate a very different conclusion. Dark Hammarskjöld was in today's jargon or terms an anti-hegemonic secretary general. Mm -hmm. For the reasons I tried to explain, he followed the substance of the UN Charter. And it didn't matter which country violated the substance, mm -hmm. that he took the country to task as much as it was possible within the limitations, because he couldn't do that on his own. He needed, like today, a mandate from the Security Council. And the Security Council was then as divided as it is today. So you needed to apply a lot of diplomatic skills, identifying windows of opportunity 
to get an agreement which allowed you to become active. And he displayed extraordinary skills on several occasions. The Suez crisis was a textbook example of that. I'm not sure, do we have the time that I can shortly summarize that? Of, 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 of course, of course. And as well, uh, if you can just highlight uh, on the accessibility of the sources that are, you know, I, I know you, you did not uh, consult much of them or any of them, uh, those that are found in the United Nations, are they accessible to uh, the ordinary person or there is material that is uh, strictly and uh, uh, strictly and significantly censored such that uh, uh, it's only exposed or it's only accessed by a select few individuals who are possibly connected up to the top? Most United Nations documents uh, are archived and freely accessible. There is a dark Hammarskjöld library at the UN headquarters in New York. It's open also as far as I know for the public. And you can also access their records, I think, electronically. Mm -hmm. And uh, as far as I remember, they are very helpful. They are actually grateful if there is interest from a wider audience. Mm -hmm. They remain classified documents until the very day, even when they are dating back uh, 60 years like in the case of the plane crash at Dola, which cost the life of Dark Hammarskjöld and 15 others on board of the plane. So you are not able to access all documents of the United Nations. And they relate also to the protection of personal interest and other things. Uh, in the case of Dark Hammarskjöld, to give you a very update uh, example, just recently Sir Brian Urquhart died, 101 years of age. He was serving from the first to the fifth Secretary General of the United Nations. And he was an Under Secretary General with Dark Hammarskjöld. And there were quite some interesting documents in 1960, 1961, which were categorized under Brian Urquhart or relating to Brian Urquhart, who was also involved in the Congo crisis on the side of the United Nations, where it would have been very very much of interest to access those documents. But since Sir Brian was alive until this year, they were classified. And this is now a very interesting uh, issue. If and when those documents, where some of us hope they might shed some more light on what happened in Dola when the plane crashed, are made open and accessible to the public. Because until now, the argument was it needs to protect the personal privacy of the person in question, Brian Urquhart. So that is one of the recent examples. So of course, there are classified documents like in any archive of any government institution, um, also in the United Nations. But most of the things are actually accessible. And there is a UN, United Nations history project which has published and made accessible interviews over decades of United Nations history, among others related to Tom Wies, a professor at New York uh, University, City University. And they have interviews also with people of that time and their experiences during their services, which is a huge source of information. And as I mentioned, the four volumes with the speeches and writings of Dark Hammarskjöld, which were um, compiled and edited by two US American scholars who previously also served in the United Nations, are another fantastic source of information, which is underutilized until the very day. Wow, wow. Uh, uh, something so, would need may to I quickly done. return to the Suez crisis because it's yeah, a textbook yeah, example? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Suez crisis was brought about when Abdel Nasser, as the head of state for Egypt, flagged that he wants to nationalize the Suez Channel. Mm -hmm. Canal which was against the interests of Great Britain and France, who were in control over the Suez Channel. So they, together with Israel, conspired a military attack by Israel to prevent the nationalization and basically seize control over the Suez Canal. Mm -hmm. Now, then as much as today, 
while this clearly is in violation of the interests of a member state of the United Nations, and even if the member state wants the United Nations support to negotiate the conflict, it requires a mandate from the Security Council. Council yeah in which Great Britain and France were permanent members with veto power. powers. Mm -hmm. So the assumption was that will never fly. But it was a time, the mid 1950s, where funny enough in parallel, the Soviet Union and the United States of America both had interests in the liberalization of global trade which was clashing with the interests of this then still in existence colonial powers mm -hmm. like Great Britain and France, who had direct control over large areas in which natural resources were accessible. So all of a sudden, there was a constellation where Hammarskjöld realized he would be able to bring the USA and the Soviet Union with shared interests on board. And he managed to, to bring Tunisia, which was a non-permanent member of the Security Council at the time under Bourguiba, well respected from the Global South, to submit a draft resolution to the Security Council, seeking a mandate for the United Nations to intervene to find a solution to the Suez crisis. And that draft resolution, A, from a non-allied Global South member state, which mm -hmm. is a clever thing, B, supported explicitly by both the Soviet Union and the United States of America, basically in effect eliminated the veto power of France and Great Britain they could not veto a draft resolution supported by the USA in the mid 1950s during the Cold War. So the only thing they could do was they abstained. And with their abstention, Dark Hammarskjöld got the mandate to establish a peace building force of the United Nations, which then was basically bringing about the blue helmets with norms and regulations, which with very few minor changes is still applied and implemented today. So that was one of the success stories, of course, widely celebrated, but make no mistake, just to show the limits to office. In parallel, the Soviet Union occupied Hungary to come to the rescue of a dictatorial regime, which was a close ally to the Soviet bloc. And Hammarskjöld actually was seeking for a similar mandate that the UN intervenes in Hungary in support of the democracy movement there. And that was blocked by a veto of the Soviet Union. And he couldn't do anything. So when they discussed the Suez crisis in the Security Council, Hammarskjöld very frustratedly then also remarked, and the similar should have applied to Hungary, indicating that he was not satisfied at all, that he was not getting a mandate to intervene in Hungary. Mm -hmm. He was not getting a mandate earlier on to intervene in Guatemala, where the USA uh, toppled a legitimate government. Mm -hmm. He was not getting a mandate later on in 1961 when France occupied Biserta in Tunisia, where he wanted to have a mandate. These are some of the noteworthy examples where you could see, even if he wanted to get a mandate, he didn't get it. Get it, yeah, yeah. So there were always these constraints and limitations to diplomacy. He got another mandate then when it comes to the Congo. And that might be another story we could discuss if we have the time, because that is of course, a core chapter in the book, which we talk about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Thank you very much for that. So uh, it's clear that you convincingly argue that uh, Hammarskjöld distanced him, himself uh, from Western governments uh, and sought to maintain his office as an impartial actor in the Cold War and that uh, 
uh, the, the manifold limitations of the United Nations, particularly in trying to curb uh, the excesses of power, powerful states um, constrained Hamashul's ideals. In light of, of, of this, how far true is uh, the claim that Hamashul unduly colluded with Western governments uh, over these issues? And uh, this could have been responsible for his death in 1961. There is this perception. It also exists among some, not all, but among some African scholars. Um, of lately, there was a PhD thesis by a Swedish young diplomat who is now in the diplomatic service, which he entitled the Machiavelli of Peace, which is not really sounding like a compliment, um, which is a catchword which was uh, actually uh, used by someone who was closely collaborating with uh, Dark Hammarskjöld um, and was uh, one of his special representatives in the Congo who called him like that. But I think mainly to deviate from his own failures. Um, I think it's a misperception. Hammarskjöld operated within limitations. Limitations which to a lot extent did not allow him to act against Western interests as described. And in very few cases also did not allow him to act against Soviet interests. So it was both, but it was, as it mainly remains to some extent, despite the shifts in global power structures, was mainly a world determined by Western influence and interests. So to act against their interests within the confinements of the office and the institution was almost a mission impossible. Yeah. So if you are willing to see those limitations of the office, then it would be fair enough not to blame the individual for the failures, not to live up to certain standards. Stand yeah, yeah, yeah because he is a captive of the structures. Mm -hmm. And to that extent, Dark Hammarskjöld is actually an interesting general lesson in the way, where are the borders for whatever you want to do? If you enter a certain arena, tasked with certain um, obligations, you are actually moving into a limited forum, scope. So you must be willing to accept the limitations of your mandate. Yeah. Very much to your frustration. And he was very frustrated at many times. And he was very frustrated also when the Soviet Union accused him of being a Western agent. Um, by the way, um, he was very much latest since the Suez crisis. Uh, criticized by Great Britain and, the, and France, they never liked Dark Hammarskjöld. So if you look at that, of course. Mm -hmm. And John F. Kennedy, when he moved into office, had huge problems to appreciate Hammarskjöld's role in the Congo. Mm -hmm. So it's not that Dark Hammarskjöld was very popular among the Western dominant states. Yeah, yeah, he yeah, was yeah. very popular for a long time among African countries the newly independent African states, because they considered him as his, as their secretary general. General, yeah. Mm -hmm. One anecdote. Hammarskjöld had internalized these Swedish values that you're not supposed to stick out, lagom. So you need to keep a low profile. You should never brag. You should never, you know, run around waving your merits and so on. But in a letter to one of his closest friends, the painter Bobesco, who also made all the paintings which you can now see on display in the United Nations and elsewhere, in one of these letters, he attached a caricature, a cartoon, which was in, I think it was the New York Times or the Washington Post or any one of those huge, big, influential US American newspapers. And that cartoon showed Nikita Khrushchev and uh, General de Gaulle from France. And they were meeting and in the center uh, down like a toy was a tank. And um, Khrushchev had a badge wearing which said, I don't like duck. And de Gaulle had a badge wearing, I don't like duck either. 
And Hamash had sent that to Bubesco and said, I normally don't brag, but I take this as a compliment. Oh. <laughs> so he felt very comfortable with that because for him it was kind of a confirmation mm -hmm. that he did some right things to the awe and the anger of those folks mm -hmm. from both camps. And I think that was for him the most important. For him also, the United Nations was the platform Mm -hmm. or not the strong states, but the weak states. And he repeatedly said, the United Nations as a family of nations is there to give the voice to those who are normally not heard, mm -hmm. not to those who speak all the time. And I think he was credible to an extent also in what he tried to implement during the course of decolonization on the continent, that was the decade, the 1950s, where the winds of change were blowing across the continent, mm -hmm. that those leaders who had as a point of departure the Bandung Conference in 1955, at a time where there were just two or three African countries independent, all the others only followed thereafter, that he got their trust in what he was trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. And when in 1960, late 1960, the Soviet Union asked him to resign as secretary general, he held an impromptu speech in the General Assembly where he said, and that is accessible on YouTube and it's a very moving historical document. Mm -hmm. uh, it's seven or eight minutes, it's really touching. So Hammarskjöld said then, if a big power asks to resign, it's very easy to do so. Mm -hmm. It's far less easy not to do so, but stay in the office against the wish of such a big power. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the moment those who are not the big powers would ask me to resign, I would do so with immediate effect. <laughs> And at that moment, he was interrupted by a standing ovation. Okay, wow, you could wow, see wow. in the auditorium, Nehru from India, Bourguiba from, from Tunisia, Sekou Touré from Guinea, Kwame Krumah from Ghana. All those leaders, those iconographic leaders yeah. at that time, mm -hmm. they knew exactly what he meant mm -hmm. and documented basically demonstrated, even when they were close to the Soviet Union or close to the Western countries, that their solidarity rested with this Secretary General. General, yeah. And when he became more and more under pressure, that was sh shortly before his death, he obviously, based on reports which are accessible, started to think how he could reduce the decisive influence of the Sec Security Council meaning the decisive influence of the big powers and to some extent replace it through more decision-making authority of the General Assembly, which by then already outnumbered the member states from the Global South to those who were the influential ones of the Western or the Eastern industrialized countries who were the big ones. So that was a very interesting thing he was mm -hmm. basically thinking about. How could he, and of course also with the interest, how could he strengthen his own mandate by being able to rely more often on a vote taken in the General Assembly by majority mm -hmm. instead of being dependent on a Security Council, which actually translates until the very day into being dependent on the support of the five permanent members that they don't veto any resolution that is submitted to the council. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. So basically to get back to your question, mm -hmm. those who would say, because he colluded with Western powers, he was, let me use the word assassinated in a plane crash, they get it wrong. Yeah, I think yeah. the evidence we have today is exactly the opposite because he refused to collude sufficiently mm -hmm. with the Western powers. We have reason to assume 
that the plane that crashed at Dola, killing him and 15 others, was not crashing by accident. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, wow. Um, so how, how did African, African stakeholders engage with the United Nations? Um, and to, to what extent did they impact Hammarskjöld's perceptions and approach towards uh, the decolonization and as well the Cold War? Was decolonization a predominantly uh, Western affair in which uh, African actors did not do much uh, or did not influence much or impact? No, um, Anotita, I think it was exactly the opposite. Western countries never volunteered to decolonize. Mm -hmm. It was the global South that managed to hijack normative frameworks, mm -hmm. which were drafted mm -hmm. with a very different intention, where it didn't dawn on the Western uh, architects of those normative frameworks that they would be used against them. Mm -hmm. Because in their hierarchical thinking, colonies were not autonomous actors on the same par. Mm -hmm. So they were basically considering all the normative frameworks they drafted as something which is a social contract between them, mm -hmm. but not including all the others. Yeah. And yeah. then all of a sudden from the late 40s, early 1950s, all the others raised their voice and said, hello, but this is what you said in that normative framework and you need to apply it. It starts with the Atlantic Charter as a pre-convention to the United Nations Charter. It continues with the United Nations Charter, with the human rights document, and with the establishment of the Trusteeship Council in the United Nations. And it was very interesting for the first time, human rights were used for a condemnation of apartheid South Africa. In the late 1940s, when India, represented by the Nehru government, accused South Africa of racial discrimination. Mm -hmm. Now, sadly, and ironically so, with reference to the discrimination of the Indian minority population and not the black majority population. So that's a bit of a ironic twist of it. But the fact of the matter is that the South African government with a head of state who was involved in the creation of the, um, of the early uh, United Nations body was condemned for racial discrimination by the United Nations upon initiative of India. And the trusteeship council was then taken to task because the definition of self-determination became a matter of contestation with the Bandung Conference and related things. And there Hammarskjöld already played a role. Mm -hmm. He described colonialism as um, an untenable affair. That was the word he used. Colonialism mm -hmm. is untenable. Mm -hmm. And he strongly believed in the right of self-determination. And one of the examples is when in 1958, I believe, Guinea became, became independent under Secretary and refused the regulations imposed by France, because that was, of course, always the, the thing, the former colonial powers always tried to maintain ultimate control, even mm -hmm. over decolonized territories. Mm -hmm. France then insisted uh, Guinea should remain part of the four zone and should be packed basically also in its economic policy entirely mm. to the previous quote unquote motherland. And mm. Touré refused to do so. And Dark Hammarskjöld against the wish of France and others dispatched a UN mission to support Guinea in its efforts to run an independent policy because he felt strongly self-determination means they are entitled to their own way of development. Now, let me hasten to add, he never promoted socialism. 
he was a Keynesian economist. So it's not, I'm not trying to, to fabricate something which he never was. But he was a cosmopolitan, open-minded, almost libertarian thinker who said development has different ways. And as I said before, he also always stressed economic development is more important than anything else as an ingredient to stability, justice, and peace. And he also in some speeches made it very clear, and he was, I think, until the very day almost, the only secretary general who regularly attended and spoke to the ECOSOC meetings in Geneva. He was there because to, say, to show that this is one of the most important bodies dealing with global economic relations. And he always said, as long as the terms of trade are lopsided to the extent as they are, one should not blame the weak countries for lack of delivery, but one should blame those who exploit the unequal relations for their own gains and benefits. And I think that was very important and that was a message which clearly came across. And in 1959, at the end of December until mid uh, January 1960, Dark Hammarskjöld traveled through more than 20 African countries in a non-stop tour to familiarize himself with the local situations. And I find it also very striking uh, to explain his approach. When John Steinbeck, the famous US American author with whom he was a close friend, asked him once, what would be the best way to learn more about other people, other countries, and other cultures? Doc Hammarskjöld replied, sit down on the ground and listen. I wish so much leaders today would do what he said. Sit down on the ground and listen. And that's what he did. And I think that was a sign of respect and recognition, also of otherness, but also as an indication of the effort to understand mindsets. Exactly. And then realize they are not so different. It's a common experience in anti-racist work that you say, the moment you are willing to listen to others, then the more you listen to them, the more you find out they are not strangers. Yeah. So coming back to your question, no, I don't think he colluded with the West. Mm -hmm. He was forced by circumstances to accept a limiting framework, but not out of free choice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is wonderful. Uh, Professor Henning Melba, thank you very much uh, for this uh, conversation. Uh, thank you very much for joining me on the show. Viewers and listeners, this was Professor Henning Melba. Uh, he is the author of the book, uh, Doug Hammarskjöld, The United Nations and the Decolonization of Africa. This book was published by Haste Publishing in 2018. Like I said, uh, when the show began, I'm going to paste the link to the direct access of this book on our YouTube uh, description panel uh, for the upload of this video and as well on our Facebook page so that you can directly access it and read it. I'm very much happy to have heard you, Professor uh, Henin Melba. Have a good day. The same to you and the same to all of those who are listening and have not yet fallen asleep. That is wonderful. Thank you very much.